Good morning and welcome to Armin Hammer's um, Ruminant Seminar Series. Uh, today we have Jesse Thompson and Dr. Zandra Smith presenting on clostridial challenges in U.S. beef and dairy cattle and how bacillus works to reduce these challenges. Just some housekeeping things first. Uh, we will be recording the seminar, so all your brilliant ideas will be captured on the, uh, on the recording. We also will be allowing you to submit questions throughout the seminar. So you can just see uh, you submit the questions through your chat box and we'll be able to compile those and hold the questions until the end of the seminar. So with that, I'll introduce our first speaker, uh, Jesse Thompson. Jesse is the research manager for the Rumen Product Development and Innovation Team. His group has been impressive. Jesse joined us uh, as AgroBiosciences in 2015, of course, as part now of uh, Arm & Hammer Animal and Food Production in 2017 when AgroBiosciences was acquired. So Jesse has led the team to actually sample now representatively about 15% of the U.S. dairy. So that means that samples from farms that Jesse's team has processed represent a total uh, in terms of cow populations about 15 percent of u.s dairy so it's an amazing database an amazing amount of work and jesse will be presenting the the first part which is really the clostridial challenges in u.s beef and dairy cattle so with that i'll turn it over to jesse all right thank you tom So just kind of an overview of the first presentation we'll be going through today, uh, starting with the microbial terroir process and outlining how we're assessing microbial challenges in, in dairy systems. Um, secondly, we'll go over an introduction to Clostridia. Uh, this has been our primary focus of bacterial challenges in, in dairy and beef industries to this point, and the samples that Tom referenced uh, going over what we've found um, from our survey work, uh, sampling dairies and beef feedlots across the United States and what clostridia populations and levels that we've found um, in those samples throughout the United States. And then we'll touch on a couple examples of if we shift the levels of clostridia or specifically clostridium perfringens, what are some of the outcomes that, that we observe on, in the dairy industry. So starting off with microbial terroir, so loosely translated terroir is sense of place and terroir is a, a term typically used in the wine, wine industry and really refers to the environment and how it's impacting the, the, the flavor of a grape. So the soil, the light exposure, how, how close you are to water all impacts how the grape is growing and the flavor of the grape and then impacts how the wine would taste. So, so we like to think of this in, in uh, microbiology now looking, when we talk about the bacterial communities within animals and we talk about the microbiota, that this is the bacteria within the gastrointestinal tract uh, of these animals. But we really wanna encompass the environment and, and what different environmental factors could be contributing to the impacts of this microbial community within the gastrointestinal tract hence the term microbial terroir. So when we think about uh, on a dairy, we, we collect fecal samples for a proxy of what's occurring in the gastrointestinal tract, but, but we're also interested in other environmental impacts that, that could be affecting uh, that dairy cow. So, so the TMR, uh, weather conditions, what type of bedding they're using, uh, barn structures, um, different feed components, water, uh, all these things contribute to to the microbiota within within that dairy cow and we look at the same thing in beef feedlots so uh, collecting those feed samples bedding samples pen samples tmr um, to really assess different bacterial challenges that could be impacting that host So to this point, our primary focus has been on clostridium. So who are clostridium? Clostridium are gram-positive obligate anaerobes. Uh, they're, they're spore formers, so very stable in, in a vast array of environments. There's over a hundred species of clostridium. Uh, there's a number of pathogens. Clostridium perfringens is probably one that, that most people are familiar with, uh, capable of producing toxins and other virulence genes. 
but there's also uh, other other clostridium uh, beneficial clostridium which uh, can actually contribute to fiber degradation uh, within the rumen or the gastrointestinal tract. There's a number of clostridium that are used as solvent producers and a, on a number of species used for industrially to produce enzymes and biofuels. So when we're sampling a, a dairy, where do we find clostridia? Really, we can find clostridia in essentially any sample that we take uh, on a dairy farm. So if it's that fecal sample, intestinal tract, uh, soil samples, uh, clostridia is, is native to the soil, um, forages, water, um, silages, any samples that we're taking, we are finding clostridia for the most part. And if you look at the images in the bottom right of this slide, when those samples come to the lab and we're quantifying and characterizing these clostridia populations, these are what they look like in the lab. So you can see uh, the black color in, in morphology. Um, they're precipitating irons to form that black color. Uh, on the left, you can see uh, a standard CPA medium in which we just see that, that the black color. And the right, we use an egg yolk supplement, which we can um, differentiate between total clostridia populations and clostridium perfringens populations due to the presence of the halos uh, around the clostridium perfringens. So within the literature, there, there's a number of pathogenic clostridium species associated with disease in dairy cattle. I already touched, we already touched on clostridium perfringens. Um, we find clostridium perfringens type A most abundant within our gastrointestinal samples that, that we receive in the lab. Um, there's also other species such as Clostridium septicum, Clostridium sordellii, uh, another known toxin producer associated with sudden death, which has now been reclassified as Panay Clostridium sordellii. Um, if you look at the images on the bottom, you can see some intestinal samples of uh, dairy cows with hemorrhagic bowel syndrome or, or HBS. Uh, you can see the, the dark purple color blood clots within the intestinal tract, uh, often the jejunum uh, where they're observed. And we receive a number of these samples into the lab and we've, we understand the disease to be uh, multifactorial and polymicrobial, but when we analyze these intestinal tracts, we routinely find a high level of clostridium perfringens type A within these samples. And then there's also a, a number of species such as Clostridium chovahi, which are associated with uh, tissue uh, associated diseases such as black leg, as you can see in the images on the right. But um, for, for our purposes, we're mainly interested in the enteric associated Clostridium species such as perfringens. So this is a cartoon um, which uh, is from a Gosen et al. paper from the Journal of Veterinary Research um, that really did a good job capturing Clostridium perfringens mode of action within the gastrointestinal tract. So if you look at the, the first panel, panel one, you can see the intestinal lumen. Um, the orange rectangles are the Clostridium perfringens. And you can see that they have the capability of producing a number of enzymes, such as mucinases and sialidases, that are able to degradate this mucus layer. So, so they're able to, to cleave the components of this mucus layer, um, not only exposing the epithelial cells, but also um, making free sialic acid and mucin that can be used as nitrogen and carbon sources for the Clostridium perfringens to outgrow. Uh, Clostridium perfringens is also capable of producing toxins as you, and other enzymes, as, as you can see. Um, so after the degradation of that mucus layer, then there's exposure to the epithelial cells. And now I'm referencing panel two. Uh, exposure to toxins from the epithelial cells then can trigger uh, an immune pathway which can then trigger the, the neutrophils within, within the blood vessels of that animal. And then as we see increased um, levels of Clostridium perfringens, we start to see that epithelial cells start to degrade within that panel three. And then we see the toxins and other enzymes start to 
start to penetrate into the lamina propria uh, of that animal. And then finally, we can see that all the toxins and bacteria are starting to penetrate that epithelial layer. At this point, uh, it becomes systemically circulated, which leads to, to sudden rapid death, uh, shock, and then rapid death, which we often see in HBS. So we, we can kind of classify as we see the lower levels of Clostridium perfringens, the first two panels kind of in that subclinical category, uh, definitely stressing that animal out, causing impact on, on health and production. And then as we see those levels increase in panels three and four, leading to things such as rapid death loss. So uh, besides Clostridium perfringens and, and toxin producing Clostridia strains, uh, from our initial survey work, we've also identified a number of other species within, within the gastrointestinal samples of ruminants, um, such as Clostridium barenchii and Clostridium diolus, known to produce acetone, uh, Clostridium bifermentans, uh, a known 1,3 propendiol producer, and Clostridium uh, butyricum, which is capable of producing uh, butyrate. So uh, a number of these species follow this pathway within the rumen and the gastrointestinal tract, con converting acetate and butyrate into solvents, such as ethanol, acetone, butanol. And, and we believe these solvents to be negatively impacting rumen health and function. And when Zandra goes into a little bit more detail on mode of action, we'll see how specifically the fiber degrading populations can, can be impacted by some of these solvents if these, these clostridia are at high enough levels. So we talked about clostridium, uh, we talked about the microbial terroir process. So what does that look like? Which samples are, co are we collecting? What are we doing in the lab to characterize these populations? So if we're sampling dairy farms, we're collecting, again, fecal samples for a proxy for what's occurring within the gastrointestinal tract. We're collecting fermented feedstuffs, haylages, corn silages, um, and then TMR from, from each production group. Because different production groups are consuming different TMR, we representatively sample fecal samples from, from each of the production groups, typically 10 fecal samples. Um, from the different production groups that specific to that dairy, typically 50 to 60 fecal samples uh, per farm, five to six TMR along with the fermented feedstuffs. If they're raising calves on that location, we'll also collect uh, calf fecal samples to, to analyze for different bacterial populations. And then also feedlots. So We'll go over the, the beef cattle survey uh, across the US and collecting feedlot fecal samples um, for what's going on within that gastrointestinal tract as well as TMRs. We also routinely collect uh, bedding samples and pen samples within, within each of these pens, um, looking mainly at the, the grower and finisher phases. On the beef feedlots, generally a little larger in size, we usually collect uh, smaller amounts of fecal samples and more uh, more diversity within the pens, so a higher pen number um, to really make sure that we're capturing the diversity within that within that yard. So after these samples are collected, they'll be placed on ice and sent to our lab to arrive within 24 hours after collection. When they arrive to the lab, we'll do a numeration on TSC auger. So this will allow us to quantify the level of Clostridia in each one of these samples. We'll then harvest five colonies for each of these samples, extract the DNA from each of these Clostridia colonies, and ask the question, does that individual isolate harvested from that sample produce the alpha toxin? Uh, specific to Clostridium perfringens. If yes, and this is over 50% of the isolates in our database are identified as Clostridium perfringens, so we want to further characterize the diversity of that Clostridia population, 
we do a genetic fingerprinting technique referred to as rapid PCR, random amplification of polymorphic DNA. And, and this allows us to characterize the diversity uh, of a very prominent population uh, throughout an uh, individual dairy or throughout a region uh, across the United States or across a, a beef feedlot. So if it's not Clostridium perfringens, then we want to ask the question, what species of Clostridium is it? So we do an, another genetic technique, uh, 16S PCR, to identify what species is present, um, whether that be some of the species that we already talked about, Clostridium barianchii, the acetone producer, Clostridium bifermentans, uh, the one through propendyl producer, and then we get a nice breakdown of the Clostridia community uh, in, in an individual dairy, in an individual feedlot, or across a region or a series uh, of sites. So I, I just want to take a minute and focus in on the, on the rapid PCR and how we're characterizing the diversity of that Clostridium perfringens population. So I'm going to zoom in on this tree diagram here. So, so this is a dendogram, and it, it's, it's analyzing the genetic fingerprints from individual Clostridium perfringens isolates. So each column represents an individual Clostridium perfringens isolate. You can see the banding patterns here, the genetic fingerprints of each one of those isolates. We use bioinformatics software to determine the relationship uh, among these genetic fingerprints. And through that bioinformatics software, we're able to generate this tree diagram or dendogram um, showing us the relationship among the isolates. So if we follow this black line up, looking at these first two Clostridium perfringens isolates, uh, we can see that the first relationship right here, about 68% uh, similar, similarity between these two Clostridium perfringens isolates. And then if we go further up and look at the relationship between these two isolates and this third column, we can see about a 44% similarity between the isolates. So when we sample se uh, several samples from an individual dairy or from a region, we can see the relationship among the Clostridium perfringens isolates from that dairy or from that region. We then see a dotted line here at 75% similarity and these form clusters. So if we draw the lines here at 75% similarity, we can see uh, the diversity within, within that site or within that region based on how many clusters are present. So here we have some fairly unique Clostridium perfringens isolates. And within this cluster, we see very, very similar Clostridium perfringens isolates indicating that this makes up a larger portion of that diversity uh, on that site or on that region. So that's the lab processing technique that we use to characterize Clostridia uh, at a site or throughout a region. So uh, just to share with you some of, the, some of the survey work that we've done characterizing these Clostridia communities uh, across the United States. So here's a map of the United States broken up into nine different regions that, that we collected representative samples from to analyze Clostridia communities. This table it, it are those same nine regions. If you uh, look in the first column, you can see the number of dairies that were sampled within each of these nine regions, the number of cow fecal samples analyzed, calf fecal samples analyzed, and, and this is to quantify the levels of Clostridia or Clostridium perfringens. And then based on a subset of, of this database, we do the genetic analysis. We're actually characterizing species and diversity uh, across that region. And then you can see the combined farm sizes and the states that were sampled within each of these regions. So total, we sampled nine regions, uh, a little over 20,000 fecal samples from over 500 farms in 30 states. And, and as Tom referenced earlier, this is representative uh, of 13.8% of US dairy cows. So these are the the levels of Clostridia that we observed in each calf or cow fecal samples. So uh, on the left image, you can see the, the calf fecal sample results. On the right image, you can see the cow fecal samples results. On the x-axis are the nine different regions. 
and on the y-axis are the level of cluster to a CFU program uh, on a logarithmic scale, so 10, 100, 1,000. And, and you can really see uh, not only a high prevalence, so you don't see a lot of, of dots which represent an ind individual fecal sample on the x-axis, so mainly Clostridia is detected in all these fecal samples, but you see a wide variation ranging anywhere from undetectable levels of Clostridia all the way up to uh, 100 million CFU per gram of Clostridia within an individual fecal sample. So we can see that in over 98% of all fecal samples, we detect Clostridia. So we can also quantify the level of Clostridium perfringens. Uh, again, we see uh, a wide variation of Clostridium perfringens levels within these fecal samples, although now we see less prevalence, more dots on the, on the x-axis, but, but still a fairly high level seeing over 80% prevalence in the cows and over and 81% prevalent in the calves. So we know it's, Clostridium perfringens is prevalent in, it is there in most samples, but we're really interested in the level that it's at. We've also toxin typed each of these Clostridium perfringens isolates that we've harvested, and we found that over 99% of the isolates that were harvested in both cow and calf fecal samples were Clostridium perfringens type A, so only producing the alpha toxin. Uh, we screened four different toxin types, alpha, beta, epsilon, and iota, and we can see the majority of these isolates are type A. So we talked about the fecal sample results, uh, levels of Clostridia and Clostridium perfringens in the nine regions that sampled, but I, I just kind of want to highlight uh, some regional results. So this is looking at the southwest region, uh, a subset of the first uh, seven dairies down here. So these are cow fecal sample results. Uh, and if we look at a, a farm like Farm B, uh, the, the orange in the scatter plot, we can see that same variation that we saw within the region, looking at undetectable levels of Clostridium perfringens all the way up to a million CFU per gram of Clostridia, Clostridium perfringens in, in an individual dairy. So now if we break that down by production group, and we look at farm B uh, again, and we look at the close-up group, we're seeing the same level of variation, undetectable levels of Clostridium perfringens all the way up to a little over 100,000. So it's a, a lot of variation we're detecting in this production group, all consuming the same TMR, um, exposed to the same environmental challenges. And this has been really interesting for us to follow in determining what what's impacting that variation within these individual cow fecal samples that we're not detecting any and detecting hundreds of thousands of CFU per gram Clostridium perfringens. So it's so very exciting and we continue our research in the lab on, on what's impacting these levels of Clostridium perfringens. When we analyze this slide, a question that frequently comes up is, it, is it, is it common to see high levels of Clostridium perfringens or Clostridia in general in one specific production group? Do you routinely see high levels in the high cows and the fresh pen? And the answer is there hasn't been a consistent production group that, that we observe these high levels in. And a lot of it's driven based off of, of feed, the incoming Clostridia load that we're inoculating uh, these cows with daily or, or different environmental challenges and through the terroir program we've we've identified a number of, of different environmental challenges contributing to these high levels which is very farm specific region region specific on uh, some of these things that we're that we're identifying to be environmental challenges to to specific groups So this, these are histograms just breaking down the level of Clostridium perfringens that, that we've observed and the top histogram showing cow fecal samples and the bottom histogram showing calf fecal samples. So, so this is binning the counts that we've just viewed across the United States and less than 10, 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000, 1,000 to 10,000 and greater than 10,000 CFU per gram of Clostridium perfringens. So in cow fecal samples, we see a fairly even dif uh, distribution with the majority of the cow fecal samples um, 
in the 100 to 1,000 CFU per gram range. Uh, so this allows us to benchmark uh, other dairies or, or new regions that we sample and how do they compare to the database or other cows from that specific region. However, when we analyze the clostridium perfringens in the calf samples, we see either um, for the most part, very low levels of clostridium perfringens or very high levels of clostridium perfringens, so you're less than 10 or greater than 100,000. And this didn't really make sense to us at first until we analyzed this by calf age. So if we look at the age of the calves in week and how it correlates to clostridium perfringens counts and these CFU per gram, this is log transformed. You can see um, the black lines here represent the the medians of these counts, and you can see the decrease in clostridium perfringens as, as we analyze calves by age. So as they age, the clostridium perfringens detected in the fecal samples decreases. And we're, we hypothesize that this is mainly due to the developing immune system of that calf makes them less susceptible to pathogen colonization. So we, we showed some of the survey results uh, from, our, from our regional sampling, but what, how are these regions different? Uh, are the diversity of the Clostridium perfringens, the species we're detecting, is it region, region specific? Are we seeing differences in these nine regions that we sampled from? So earlier we talked about the genetic fingerprints and the, the dendrograms that we looked at characterizing the diversity of Clostridium perfringens. And, these are those dendrograms that extremely zoomed out view, but, but I just like to show this, uh, showing that you can see a lot of small black lines here, indicating a lot of very small clusters, a lot of unique Clostridium perfringens isolates compared to uh, the rest of the region at the whole. So this top one is analyzing the Eastern Great Lakes. Um, we characterize diversity in microbial ecology using a Shannon Weiner index of diversity. So the higher the number, the more diverse the population is. Uh, so we see the Eastern Great Lakes in the Northeast with fairly diverse uh, Clostridium perfringens populations compared to uh, the other seven regions. So they're classified as most diverse to least diverse. So if we look at the upper Midwest region, we see long straight lines across the bottom of this dendrogram indicating uh, lots of similarity within that Clostridium perfringens community. And going back and following up and trying to answer the question, why do we see the lack of diversity within the upper Midwest compared to a region like the Eastern Great Lakes, we found that uh, a, lot of, a lot of the dairies that were sampled were sharing similar uh, similar feed stuff, similar crop types, um, using a lot of the same nutritionists, get a lot of had a lot of the feed, same feed sources, and shared a lot of the same terroir in, in in that region and in those dairy sampled compared to the Eastern Great Lakes, which, which had um, more diversity, more different types of feed stuffs, different uh, environmental factors contributing to to the diversity within those populations. So if we're just focusing on cow fecal samples, so we looked at the Clostridium perfringens population and, and the diversity within that population, but over half of that population, or, or just a little under half of that population, 47.4%, are species other than Clostridium perfringens. So, so what other species are we identifying? So Clostridium perfringens, you can see is the blue sector of these pie graphs. Um, then Clostridium berryanchii, so remember that's an acetone, pr acetone producer is in the orange region of the pie graphs, and Paraclostridium bifermentans, which is in the gray uh, of these pie graphs, the one three propendiol producer, another solvent producer. Uh, between these three species make up the, the majority uh, of that population within each of these regions. Um, some regions, if we look at a region like the upper Midwest, have a fairly low percentage of Clostridium perfringens, 38%, compared to uh, Clostridium bifermentans, 27%. So, so definitely, uh, when we're looking at differences, we see difference in species uh, across these different regions. 
Clostridium sordellii, we or panic reclassified panic Clostridium sordellii, uh, the orange sliver in some of these graphs we found to be more prevalent in, in the southwest and the northwest, uh, a little bit more in the south central, but that that was fairly specific at this abundance um, to the west and the south. So, so we saw differences in the species present and the diversity within those perfringence isolates. Uh, so we did a Konoku analysis to statistically compare the Clostridia populations. And if you look at these different regions or states that, that were classified Clostridia populations and you see a star, that's indicating significant difference in that Clostridia population where a triangle is indicating that there was no significant difference when comparing um, these different regions or different areas sampled. So we can see a number, five of, the, five of the regions here had a significantly different Clostridia population compared to, compared to the other regions. So we also collected feed samples. So the most abundant feed samples that were collected were, were TMR, corn silage and haylage. So we have our same histogram here indicating the greater than 1,000, uh, 100 to 1,000, and less than, less than 100 Clostridia CFU per gram. And, and we saw that the TMR uh, compared to the fermented feeds, which make up the majority of that TMR, had a much higher level of Clostridia. So, so we've identified um, outgrowth within Clostridia within that TMR. We've identified different contaminants that, that contribute to that higher level within the TMR. But, but what's interesting, and we first started studying Clostridia in, in the dairy industry and thinking 100 CFU per gram doesn't really seem like, like a high level of Clostridia. But, but when we take 100 CFU per gram in that TMR and multiply that by 100 pounds of intake, and then multiply by 454 to convert grams to pounds, we can see that we're inoculating a dairy cow with over 4.5 million CFU daily, uh, just based on that 100 CFU per gram within the TMR. So you can see a, a, a level of clostridia that doesn't necessarily look to be extremely high. If you take intake into consideration, it can really add up quickly. So, so that was an overview of, of the dairy survey work. So we saw a high prevalence of Clostridia and Clostridium perfringence in the cows and in the calves. But again, it's really the level that we're interested in and not the presence or absence. We, we saw a high level of variation within the total Clostridia and Clostridium perfringence uh, loads in each of the regions. And then if we zoomed it into an individual farm, and even within the same production group in the same pen, we still saw that high level of variation between, between loads of Clostridium and Clostridium perfringence that we're observing. Uh, we saw that over half, so 52.6% of those isolates were, were disease associated, uh, toxin producing Clostridium perfringence, most of which were type A, and we saw a high level of genetic diversity based on, based on those isolates that were collected. And we also saw, uh, Based on the non-disease associated, the non-perfringence, 47.4% of these isolates coming from uh, solvent producing groups, Clostridium berienchii, acetone producer, Clostridium bifermentans, 1,3-propendyl producer. And we have observed differences between the regions when we characterize Clostridium perfringence diversity and, and look at Clostridium species as a whole. And then we briefly talked about uh, Clostridia and the feed and how that can inoculate cows at a high daily level when you take intake into consideration. So I, I'm just going to briefly touch on some uh, beef uh, survey work that we've done. Um, so at the end of 2018 and throughout 2019, we've really been trying to characterize these populations within beef feedlots. Uh, so we've been getting a lot of samples into the lab, trying to better understand who's there, uh, what the diversity looks like, what levels and loads are we observing within these feedlots. Um, so from the samples that were collected so far from large feedlots, which are characterized as over 30,000 cattle on that site, we've sampled 12 of these feedlots uh, in four states, a little under 2,000 fecal samples and a little over 500 environmental samples. 
Uh, five of these feedlots we've sampled multiple times throughout the course of a year, looking at variation over time, seasonal impacts, and trying to better understand uh, what these loads look like at an individual site. When, when you think about the terroir and all the new diversity coming and circulating through through the feed yard, and this is representative of uh, over 600,000 cattle based on these samples collected. And then we've also sampled a number of these smaller feedlots, less than 30,000 head, uh, 14 total feedlots in six states, uh, over 700 sam uh, fecal samples and over 100 environmental samples, representing 83,000 cattle. So when we look at prevalence, we see that same high prevalence. Uh, all, all of the fecal samples, over 98% um, within the survey, uh, had detectable levels of of Clostridia. When we look at the loads of, of that Clostridia, comparing dairy to, to the small feedlots and, and large feedlots, we do see higher levels of Clostridia in both the, the large beef feedlots and the small feedlots compared to what we observe in dairy. Looking at the prevalence of Clostridium perfringens, slightly less in the large beef, 77.7% .7 compared to 80.4% in dairy, and much lower in the small feedlots that were sampled. Only 67.7% of those samples are positives. But again, it's not the presence or absence that we're interested in. It's really the, the level that they're, that they're present in that, that we're really interested in. And when we compare the, the large feedlots to dairy and small feedlots to dairy, we see that the, the large feedlots actually have significant higher levels than Clostridium perfringens. However, small beef have significantly lower levels compared to dairy. And then I, I mentioned that we were uh, collecting uh, different groups, the, the starter versus the finisher fecal samples, and we can see that the finisher samples on both uh, total clostridium and clostridium perfringens had significantly higher loads compared, compared to the, the starter samples. And, and we're really thinking this is probably more of a, an available starch within the gastrointestinal tract, uh, allowing for more clostridia outgrowth within those later phase, phases on the, on the feed yard. So when we're looking at species of these different populations, uh, large beef uh, comparable to dairy as far as Clostridium perfringens, about 52%, a little more Clostridium bifermentans compared to Clostridium barienchii. However, the small feedlots had a lot less Clostridium perfringens as we saw in the, the prevalence uh, figures a few slides ago, and more Clostridium barienchii um, compared to both dairy and the large feedlots. So uh, a summary, we saw total clostridia, again, high prevalence, much like we saw in dairy. Uh, we saw higher levels in both large and small feedlots compared to the, the dairy survey work. And we see the finisher clostridia higher level than, than the starter uh, fecal sample clostridia. Clostridium perfringens, uh, again, Fairly high prevalence, lower in the small beef, uh, mainly toxin type A. Uh, again, 99% um, of the isolates were identified as Clostridium type A, Clostridium perfringens type A. Uh, we saw higher levels of Clostridium perfringens in the large beef compared to what we see in dairy. And again, higher in the finisher phase compared to the starter phase. And then as far as Clostridia populations grow, we saw the, the large feedlot at a similar percentage of perfringents as dairy. However, the small feedlot, uh, small beef feedlots had more of barienchii compared to the large feedlots in dairy. So uh, I have about five minutes left here. I just want to quick touch on the, the so what. So, okay, we've identified these Clostridia populations within dairy, within beef. I just thought I'd show you a couple of examples that, that we have. What would happen if you could reduce the load or the levels of Clostridia on a dairy? Um, so we really talked about two different kinds of species of, of Clostridium. And one being Clostridium perfringens, a toxin producer, and the other group being the solvent producer. So I wanted to show you an example of each. And by lowering these levels to, to, to lower loads uh, across the dairy, what are some of the impacts that, that we've observed? 
So I have, I have two individual dairy samples and then the, the meta-analysis of the 45 herds that we've sampled uh, before and, and well, by lowering the load. So um, looking at a, a high perfringence dairy, so this is the first example. So the, the top histogram is indicating total clostridia loads and the bottom histogram is, is looking at clostridium perfringence loads. The, the red is indicating uh, a pretreatment sampling and, and the blue is indicating after being on a bacillus-based targeted microbial solution, Sertilis, for 100 days to reduce the, to reduce the clostridia loads. So when we look at the total clostridia population, we can see that 40% of the fecal samples uh, fell within this 100 to 1,000 CFU per gram range. 20% fell within this greater than 10,000 range of total clostridia. If we follow this down to the clostridium perfringence, we see that same 40% and 20% in these same ranges, indicating to us that this is a clostridium perfringence dominant challenge here. So most of these high levels greater than 1,000 CFU per gram. If you remember the dairy survey work, remember the most common range is the 10, uh, 100 to 1,000 CFU per gram, so much higher than our, our typical fecal sample and all of it is identified as clostridium perfringens. So then after uh, 100 days consuming Sertilis to lower the clostridia loads, uh, we see that during the follow-up sampling where the same set of fecal samples were collected, uh, we see a reduction in this 100, uh, 1,000 to 10,000 CFU per gram of total clostridia from 40% to 22.5%. And in this greater than 10,000 from 20% to 2.5%. Taking that down to clostridium perfringence, we see, remember we're at 60% total greater than 1,000. Now greater than 1,000, we're at 15% with the 12.5 and the 1,000 to 10,000 and the 2.5 and greater than 10,000. So by shifting those populations to a lower level on a high perfringence challenge dairy, what were the observations? So these are the lab observations that we just went over. Farm observations, more consistent manure, more consistent intakes, fewer cows in the sick pen, fewer off-feed events. They saw a positive energy corrected milk response. Uh, they saw feed efficiency improvements. And most importantly, uh, on the most quantitative result based on the shift of perfringence to, to lower levels, they saw a large decrease in GI-related deaths. So they're averaging 30 per month, and this was reduced down to two or three per month. So perfringents, toxin producing, experiencing HBS, um, by shifting those to lower levels, we saw the decrease in GI-related deaths. Now to focus on high levels of clostridia that were not identified as perfringents. So we have our same setup that we looked at in the first example. So total clostridia, clostridium perfringence. Again, if we focus in those higher levels, a thousand, greater than 1,000 CFU per gram, we see in the red in the pretreatment that we have 30.8% in the 1,000 to 10,000 and 7.7% in the greater than 10,000. So uh, about a, a little over 38% in that greater than 1,000. If we look at the perfringence, only uh, a little over 11% is clostridium perfringence, indicating that it's other species of clostridia that are at this high level, identified as clostridium barenchii and clostridium bifermentans. So if we reduced this, th this high level to, after 120 days on Sertilis, to 6%, and then the clostridium perfringence was reduced to 0% in this greater than 1,000 window here. What were some of the observations that, that we witnessed on this dairy? So we, we saw more consistent manure, fewer off-feed events, more consistent intakes. Uh, we saw positive energy corrected milk response of about three pounds and feed efficiency improvements. So, Comparing the two, uh, the toxin producing clostridium challenge to the solvent producing clostridium challenges and, and some outcomes, an example of each of what was observed. So as I mentioned now, we, we've done this type of fecal sampling 
before uh, using Sertilis and after using Sertilis on 45 different dairies across the U.S. Uh, if we look at the, the total Clostridia population, and again, focusing on that high risk group, which would be greater than 100, uh, greater than 1,000 CFU per gram within the fecal samples, but we're reducing the total Clostridia load by 33% in that high risk group. And we're reducing the, the level of Clostridium perfringens by 40% in this high risk group. So we're taking them out of that high risk group and we're shifting more to the low risk group, which would be less than 100 CFU per gram. So we're increasing that low risk level of total Clostridia by 65% and that low risk level of Clostridium perfringens by, by 19%. Seeing a lot of the same observations that we saw in the first two examples, um, fewer off feed events, uh, less cows in the sick pen, uh, herds that we've tested that have rumination monitors, we've seen an increased rumination all by shifting these clostridia loads to from the high risk group greater than 1,000 to the low risk group of less than 100 CFU per gram. So with that, I will turn over the presenting rights to Zandra who will show you how the bacillus within Sertilis impact uh, both Clostridia populations and uh, the host within uh, consuming the Sertilis. So just to introduce Zandra, Dr. Zandra Smith, she got her PhD from the University of Illinois. Uh, she came to agrobioscience in 2013, one of the original founding group, and leads at Arm & Hammer, the molecular ecology and molecular microbiology research team. Looking forward to your presentation, Sandra. There's some new slides, new observations, and some great new data as Sandra and her team begin to dig into how do these bacillus work, much more than just inhibition of the Clostridia, but also how they can impact the host and the resident microbiota within these cows. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sandra. Thank you, Tom. Okay, I thought I'd start by first explaining a little bit about the genus bacillus. So there are over 300 species and subspecies of bacillus. However, there are only six that are on the list of approved direct fed microbials in the United States that are generally considered as safe, safe and that's on the APCO list. So that's amyloliquefaciens, coagulants, lentus, lichenformis, pumilus, and subtilis. Um, if you go to the EU, there, there's about 14 bacillus on that list. But these are the ones that we, we get to work with, but there are a lot of advantages to bacillus. And one of those is that they're spore formers. So if you see this picture here, they normally thought of as being soil bacteria. And then when the soil gets desiccated, they form a spore. But I'll show you in the next slide that they also found in the gastrointestinal tract. So if bacillus are in the vegetative cycle, they divide by binary fission and they will grow. But as soon as there's any, you know, they starve, desiccated, heat, antibiotics, then instead of forming dividing by binary fission, they'll form asymmetric cell division, form a septum, and form a really thick spore coat, and end up with a spore that will then, can then germinate once conditions are right again. So because of this thick spore coat, they're able to survive pelleting, they don't need to be kept refrigerated, there are a lot of advantages to bacillus in that sense on farm. However, they do grow and germinate within the gastrointestinal tract. In fact, bile salts are one of the germination triggers for um, bacillus spores. So there's a study here done by Lesser et al. in 2008, where they put spores, bacillus spores, into a dialysis bag. So at zero hours, and this was, this was done in swine, um, only 12.5% of the cells that were present were vegetative cells. After four to six hours, they found um, these dialysis bag in the stomach and duodenum of the swine. And in this case, there was an increase in bacteria and 28% were now vegetative. After 24 hours, they found these dialysis bags in the stomach um, and then in the cecum and colon as well. Again, now we've got less spores, but we've got a lot more vegetative cells that have grown during this time. Um, again, about half a log higher than what was originally added into the dialysis bag and 88% of these cells are now vegetative. So bacillus do grow, replicate, and produce some of these secondary metabolites that they're known for within the gastrointestinal tract. 
So at Arm & Hammer, we've been selecting the specific bacillus strains um, to improve performance in livestock, but they have a number of different modes of action. So we'll be looking at some of the direct effects on pathogens through the secondary metabolites they produce. Those are lipopeptides, polyketides, and um, peptides. Then we'll be looking in more detail at the effects on specific gastrointestinal microbiota. So Jesse showed you some of that already. Um, we'll be looking at a specific farm and looking at the decreasing loads of clostridia, decreased diversity of clostridia. And then something that Jesse also mentioned, we've also noticed that we, there's an increase in fiber degraders when we reduce these clostridia in the, in the rumen. Um, there's also a general effect on the gastrointestinal microbiome and that's shown in microbial succession and metabolite production. And then you're putting a live organism into a live host. There's gonna be some effect on the host. And so we've um, monitored changes. We've looked at immune modulation and barrier function. So if you look at bacteria, 99% of bacteria produce some sort of antimicrobial compound, and that enables them to compete within the niche in which they grow. So I show four different types of bacteria here, the, their genomes, and the size of the genome represents the size of the genome within that bacteria. So you'll see E. coli has a much larger genome than some of these other ones, which means it also has a lot more um, genes and enzymes that it can produce. However, if you look at E. coli, this particular one only produces three antimicrobials shown here in green, colicin, um, tyrinibactin, and yersiniabactin. This clostridium perfringens, which is one of the ones that JC isolated during his screening, only produces a sactipeptide. Lactobacillus plantarum also produces um, plantaricin. But if you look at this Bacillus subtilis 1999, there are 11 different regions shown in green of secondary metabolites and antimicrobial com um, compounds. And what are some of these metabolites? Well, this is a, um, a cartoon of FZB42, which was selected for plant growth promotion. Um, and it produces a number of lipopeptides. So lipopeptides contain um, about seven amino acids that are circularized and then a lipophilic tail. And this lipophilic tail can have different sizes. So here, C10 to 12, C13 to 14, C11 to 13. Um, it also produces, and this is again non-ribosomally produced like the lipopeptides, a number of polyketides, these, these complex chemical structures shown over here. Um, and then it also produces sort of the more traditional peptide bacteriosins that people are used to and, and shown here as a dipeptide bacillation. And sidorophores, most bacteria that grow within the gastrointestinal tract need iron to grow. And um, the ones that are able to sequester the iron and take it up into the cells get a competitive advantage within the gastrointestinal tract and within the host itself. And this particular organism also produces a couple of plant growth promoting hormones, which is actually selected as a plant growth promoter. So what do some of these compounds do? Well, if you look at lipopeptides, so they have this lipophilic tail shown here in red, and they actually disrupt membrane function of the pathogens by anchoring within the cell membrane. So what's shown here is over time, if you put a lipopeptide on a, a lipid bilayer, it will penetrate over time into the cells and produce pores. And then, you know, the, the bacterial cell itself won't be able to grow, won't be able to replicate, won't be able to get energy. And again, it depends on the type of peptide as to how it will bind and attach to the bacterial cell, and also the length of the carbon and lipophilic tail as to how it will get into the membrane. And then the type of lipid membrane as well. So it depends on how the bacteria cell itself has formed its membrane as to which ones will be effective. So polyketides, they are known to inhibit protein syn synthesis of pathogens, and they bind to the 50S ribosomal subunit. So this is the tunnel where the peptide as it's being produced will be coming coming out but the polyketide will bind within that tunnel so here's a different view here's the 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 tunnel you've got your polyketide bound there you will not be able to oh sorry the bacteria will not be able to produce the proteins and enzymes that it requires so it might not kill the bacteria um, straight away it might, might not be bactericidal but it won't be able to grow and replicate and metabolize what it needs to metabolize 
Um, the dipeptide basilacin that I showed you that FZB42 also produces, it's actually an alanine and an anti-capsin dipeptide, which is produced within the host cell, so the, within the bacill bacillus cell, and then gets extruded out of the cell and gets taken up by a pathogen. So the pathogen sees this dipeptide as a protein source. It takes it into the cell, peptidase then um, degrades this peptide. You get your alanine, which the cell can use, but the anti-capsin can actually bind to glucosamine synthetase. And glucosamine synthetase is an important enzyme for cell wall production. So again, the bacteria won't be able to replicate. So lantibiotics is another type of antibiotic or an, another type of um, peptide that bacteria produce, and these have lanthionines in them. And the example here shown is nicin, and bacillus produced um, these lantibiotics as well. And nicin inhibits cell wall synthesis by binding to the lipid 2 of the outer cell membrane. So if there's just small amounts of nicin, it'll just bind to the lipid 2 and will prevent the cell from being able to, to grow and replicate. However, if there's a lot of nicin present, then it'll actually start forming pores and then the cell will actually start to die. I also mentioned siderophores. So bac the bacteria in the gut and within the, the host system need iron to grow and iron is limiting within um, the host system. So organisms like extra intestinal um, E. coli, the ones that are able to access iron um, will be able to grow better. So often virulence factors within extraintestinal um, E. coli are those iron scavenging type um, genes. So for example, here we've got enterobactin produced by E. coli, bacillobactin, which is produced by bacillus, and um, it will bind the iron, and then it also needs to be taken up back into the cell. So that gives the, the bacteria that have the best siderophores a competitive advantage. So I showed you some of these different types of lipopeptides, polyketides, they all have different kind of structures and different bacteria produce different ones of these, but then it also affects the pathogens differently. So what I'm showing you here is um, bacteria that have a gram-positive cell wall and bacteria that have a gram-negative cell wall. So the gram-positives have the much thicker peptidoglycan, whereas the gram-negatives have um, a thinner peptidoglycan layer and an outer and an inner membrane. Um, what I've shown here is different types of pathogens. So we've got Streptococcus suus, Clostridium perfringens, E. coli, and Salmonella. If the bacteria are inhibited, then it's shown in red. If there's no inhibition, it's shown in green. So across the top are just a, a, cup, a handful of uh, the bacillus and our microbial terroir program that Jesse was telling you about. And so you'll see if you look at strep suis, most of our bacillus can inhibit most of the streptococcus, but not all of them. For example, only 747 can inactivate this particular strain of streptococcus suis, whereas the others don't really have much of an effect. And yet the others affect more of the others. So it really is very strain specific as to which pathogen you're looking at and as to which bacillus you're looking at. So again, this is um, Clostridium perfringens. Most of them are fairly good at being inhibited, but then there are some that, like this bottom one, that isn't inhibited very well. Here the E. coli, um, some of our strains don't do very well against E. coli at all in this case, and the same with Salmonella. But this is just to show you that it really depends on what lipoproteins, what um, polyketides the particular bacillus are producing, as well as the type of ribosomal structure and the type of membranes that the bacteria, the pathogens have. So that was direct effect of the pathogens through secondary metabolites. Now we're going to look at some specific gastrointestinal microbiota within ruminants. And very similar to what Jesse was showing you when he showed you all these, the 45 farms, I'm just going to focus on one particular farm. And the reason for this is that this farm, we had a pre-treatment uh, section of about three months. Um, then they went on, on our Sotilis treatment, and then they went off Sotilis for another three months and then came back on. So this is really interesting interesting data. So there were about 900 milk cows, sand vetted free stall, Holsteins. Um, they were milking three times a day. They were using BST. 
So what was happening on this farm is that they were having about five digestive deaths, and this was um, an experienced herdsman determined the cause of death. So they were having about two digestive deaths per month. When they went onto the Satillus in those three months, there was only one um, digestive death noted. And then they went off treatment again, off the Satillus, and again, we went to about two deaths per month. And then they went back on treatment again and deaths dropped again. But we were interested in what was happening in that time to the bacteria within the gastrointestinal tract. So Jesse's team, you know, as he showed you, looks at the, the Crostridia levels. So if we start here with the Wisconsin survey, this is the data that Jesse showed you already with the Wisconsin survey. There's a large variation from no detectable Clostridia to about 10 to the 7 um, CFU per gram within the, the feces. This particular farm wasn't what we'd call a very really high farm. Um, there weren't really, really high Clostridia perfringens. However, when we started our treatment, there was a significant decrease in total Clostridia. This maintained for um, at day 30. Then, however, day 58, now we see an increase again in Clostridia, and then there was no change at day 86. When the animals went off treatment, Clostridia increased again. So what was happening here at day 58 that Clostridia would suddenly increase again, even though they were on treatment? Well, as Jesse said, he also looks at the microbial loads in the fermented feeds. So we were looking at coliforms, clostridia, yeast, and mold within the fermented feeds, so the haylage, silage, corn silage, whatever was being fed and whatever at, at the time. So pre-treatment levels of all these um, uh, potential pathogens or spoilage organisms were very low. However, day 16, when they're on treatment, it really increased. Yeast and mold came up really high, as did coliforms. Coliforms dropped again by day 30, but again, yeast and mold is high. And by day 58, when we're now seeing an increase in clostridia, we're seeing, I mean, this, this feed is, is actually probably spoiled at this case, in this point. And our clostridium perfringens numbers, again, within the feed, they're not really high. But as Jesse showed you, even though they might be, you know, just 100 CFU per gram, when you when that gets gets fed to a cow that can quickly um, be a fairly high load within the animal. Day 86, the feed improved again and dropped. The um, spoilage uh, organisms dropped again. So what we are also noticing is that we saw a decrease in the diversity of Clostridia. So as JC showed you, we're looking at Clostridium perfringens, Feyerinchiae, and Bifermentins, which were the predominant organisms. So if you look at the, if you compare it to the pre-treatment to the Wisconsin survey, it looks fairly similar. We've got 70% clostridium perfringens, then we have the Bayerinchia group, and then we have the Bifermentins group. Overall, we were detecting 10 different species of clostridia pre-treatment. At day 16, we're detecting, we're still detecting 10. There's been a bit of a change in some of the proportions, but we're still detecting 10 different types of clostridia. By day 30, that has decreased. Day 58, again, um, now we're just detecting five different types of clostridia. And again, on day 58, this is when the challenge was occurring, the feed challenge. Now we're seeing less proportions of clostridia perfringens, and we're seeing higher proportions of the Bayerinchia and Bifermentins, which were coming in through the feed. I'm just showing you this um, perfringens rapid dendrogram again that uh, Jesse showed you earlier because what we're seeing here is that the perfringence diversity within within these animals were or over time on this farm was reducing as well so pre-treatment the Shannon Wiener index of diversity is 4.25 which is about what you were seeing at the at the Great Lakes which was 4.2 day 16 it dropped Day 30, it had dropped even more. Day 58, again, this is when the challenge occurred, it increased, and by day 86, there was a slight drop again. And these kind of things where we're seeing a difference in the diversity of the types of clostridia we're seeing, and the, the species of clostridia, and in the diversity of the actual clostridium perfringens, we've seen on numerous farms. I'm just showing you this one, um, just to highlight some of these changes. 
So the other thing that's really important for ruminants, obviously, is fiber, fiber degradation. And there are only a couple of bacteria really in the rumen that can degrade fiber, and those are mainly the fibrobacter and ruminococci, and they're able to degrade these the cellulose and hemicellulose within the plant cell walls. And by doing that, they release the rest of the um, material within the cell wall, and there's a lot of cross-feeding that occurs. So even though the, the fiber degraders are even an animal in a high pasture, um, high forage pasture diet is less than 5% of the total bacteria in the rumen, they're essential for this cross-feeding to occur and for this fiber to be digested. And these are very sensitive bacteria as well, so they would be sensitive to the acetone and ethanol that some of these um, bacteria are producing. So if you look at the relative abundance of fibrobacter species in the rumens, this is the, in the ruminants, this is a study done by Tony Newman and Garrett Suen, and they looked within different types of ruminants. But what they found in cattle was that it's mainly fibrobacter succinogenes one, two, and four that they find. Now, before Tony started doing the study, um, everyone had worked with fibrobacter succinogenes S85, and had identified fibrobacter intestinalis. But what he's finding is that there are a lot of different types of succinogenes, and eventually these probably will be named as different species. But what Tony did for us was design primers so we can detect type one, type two, and type four, which were the most predominant ones in cattle. And we used this to detect the fibrobacter within animals that had been treated with our Cetilis compared to those that had not been treated. So this was two different farms that we had side by side pens with animals that were treated and not treated. And what we found in the first farm is that fibrobacter succinogenes one, two, and three increased. So there was almost double the amount of the fibrobacter populations within the rumen of, of the animals that were treated with the Cetilis. Um, but we didn't see any differences in ruminococcus alvis and ruminococcus flavifacients in this case. On farm B, we followed this out we did two separate time points. So day 60, we didn't really see a difference in the fibrobacter and ruminococcus in, within the gastrointestinal tract or within the rumen, actually. But by day 140, we're seeing no difference in fibrobacter succinogenes 1. We're seeing a trend in 2 and 4, but now we're seeing significant effects on the ruminococci that they are almost twofold higher than um, within the untreated animals. And this then correlates with some of the data that Jesse was showing you with um, increased milk production. So these are the effects that we're seeing, direct effects on pathogens, effect on specific gastrointestinal microbiota within ruminants. The next two sets of studies that I want to show you is actually done in poultry. And we are at the moment trying to do, we are actually doing some of these studies in ruminants as well. But we've done them in poultry because um, you can do a study within three three weeks and be and you're able to get harvest the animals and be able to really look at microbial succession within the gastrointestinal tract as well as metabolite production. And so this is a study we did with Dr. Wen Lillehoy at the USDA. And so we had um, male Dale Dross broilers. They were on normal feed for the first two weeks. Then we measured the initial body weight, put them on experimental feed. So that was, you know, the basal diet, and then Bacillus subtilis 1781 and 747, each one individually. And then at day 21, we euthanized the chickens and removed the ileal content in order to look at the microbiota and the metabolites that are being produced by these animals. Um, we also looked at body weight and feed intake. So if we start, if we look first at the growth performance of these chickens, so the initial body weight, there was no significant difference between any of these groups. The final body weight, there wasn't a significant difference, but if you look at the body weight gain, the animals on our bacillus treatment had increased, significantly increased gain. Feed intake wasn't significantly different and um, feed efficiency wasn't significantly different, although it did improve for the animals on our bacillus. We then looked at the total bacterial populations in the small intestine of these animals. So this is each animal shown individually. Each of these colored, um, e each of these bars is an individual animal, but each of these colored blocks is a specific type of bacteria. So just by eye, you can see that there's a lot of animal to animal variation. 
but what I wanted to point out was that if you look at these control animals, a lot of these animals still have a lot of E. coli um, within the gastrointestinal tract. And E. coli, the Enterobacteriaceae, are usually present in younger animals. And as the animals mature and succession occurs within the gastrointestinal tract, other bacteria become more predominant. And you'll see that here with the Bacillus 747 fed group and the 1781 fed group, that we're seeing more animals that um, have higher levels of Arthromatous, which is a clostridial type bacteria um, present within the gastrointestinal tract. And Arthromatous is a really interesting organism because what we've already seen previously with work Tim Johnson did is that these levels are higher in heavier birds. So what he did was looked at a commercial flock over time with of turkeys, and you'll see how bacteria, the bacterial succession over time and then looked at a research flock, look at bacterial succession over time. Sorry. And what you notice here is that the arthromatous is part of the bacterial succession. So in the commercial flock, arthromatous became predominant at week four, within the research flock became predominant at week two. But what he also noticed was that in heavier birds over the first three weeks, the arthromatous levels were much higher than in lightweight birds over the first three weeks. So we are seeing higher levels of arthromatous in Bacillus 747 and 1781 fed birds. The other interesting th thing about arthromatous is that they are associated with immune development. So arthromatous here are these segmented filamentous bacteria. They tend to attach very closely to the, they, within the mucus of the gastrointestinal tract, they attach very closely to the cells and they have an effect on the um, immune system, most of this was done in mice, but they stimulate the gut immune system, um, they increase protective mucosal immune activation. Um, in, in mice, it's usually, they adhere in the terminal ileum, and there's an increase in Th17 cells shown over here. And um, they also showed in a, a different study that there was resistance to the intestinal pathogen Citrobacter rodentium within mice. And this immune system development is important when I show you some of the other the slides further on about how these bacteria affect the immune system. Sorry, my slides aren't moving on. There we go. However, what's important in the immune system is not just what bacteria they are, but what they're producing. So if you look here, you'll see different types of bacteria but they might be producing the same genes and proteins. And even though these genes and proteins might be different as shown here, the same metabolites may be being produced. And it's these metabolites that then are taken up by the cells, interact directly with, within the epithelial cells, et cetera, and are also recognized by, these, um, by the immune system of the animal. So this is a summary of some of the microbial functions in the intestinal tract. So for example, conjugated bile acids are really important to be able to solubilize lipids and vitamins so that they can be absorbed by the animal. However, there are a lot of um, microbes within the gastrointestinal tract and a lot of different types of microbes that have bile salt hydrolases. And so then they will form these deconjugated, deconjugated bile acids, which are less effective at solubilizing lipids and also get excreted in the feces. So these immediately have an effect on the animal because they also, these bile acids also work as an endocrine system. Um, they actually activate some of the pathways within the, the liver. Bacteria also produce different types of fatty acids, mainly butyrate, propionate, and acetate. And these are then involved in activating the immune system as well and having a um, regulatory effect on the immune system. And then we also have degradation of amino acids, for example, tryptophan here, and you get indole and serotonin, which then also affect, uh, activates the immune system, increases IL-22, and you get increased in goblet cells and mucin, which again has a protective effect on the epithelial barrier. And it's not only tryptophan, there are other amino acids as well. For example, leucine is involved in um, signaling protein deposition and stuff like that. So it's really these metabolites that are important and not necessarily always which bacteria are 
who are producing these genes. So the study that we did with the with the um, with the broilers, some of the results were that compared to the control, the 1781 747 increased a number of these um, dipeptides. And a lot of these are leucine containing dipeptides as well. And now I don't know exactly what the role would be of these dipeptides, but what is important to know is that these are not coming from the diet because the diet was all the same. So if there's an increase in dipeptides, it is coming from the bacteria that are in the gastrointestinal tract. The other thing that actually went down is, a, is single amino acids, um, and those are taken up by the gastrointestinal tract cells easier than the dipeptides. So maybe they've been taken up and these ones are going to be taken up later. What was also interesting was when you looked at lipid pathways. So there were a couple of lipids that were accumulating within the gastrointestinal tract and that were higher in the animals on the bacillus than in the, one, than the control animals. But what was interesting here is cholesterol was, there was a reduction in the level of cholesterol in the gastrointestinal tract, indicating it was probably being taken up better. But also, if you look at the bile salts, the primary and secondary bile salts were, the level of these were reduced within the gastrointestinal tract. And this is something that is very similar to what you see with antibiotic growth promoters, that you get a reduction in both the primary and the secondary bile salts. And so I'll show you some of that, what happens. So within the liver, cholesterol becomes some of these primary bile acids. These then get excreted into the gastrointestinal tract where they get biotransformed by the intestinal bacteria to the secondary bile acids. And then these, both the primary and the secondary bile acids can be reabsorbed in the terminal ileum and get back into intrahepatic circulation. But some of these get excreted again. So the secondary bile acids, one, they're not as effective at solubilizing the lipids, but they're also toxic as well to other bacteria. So this is a, a paper from 1987 where they were looking at the effect of growth promoting antibiotics in chickens. And so polymyxin B is a growth, is an an antibiotic that does not affect growth promotion. There was no weight gain in these animals. Whereas these others, ephrotomycin, virginiamycin, penicillin, avoparsin, lincomycin, and bacitracin, all improved weight gain within these birds and improved feed efficiency as well. And all of these ones where there was improved feed efficiency, there was a decrease in bile salt hydrolases. So polymyxin that, was, that did not improve growth had 1.539 hydrolase activity, all the others were reduced, and penicillin had the, the most, had the greatest effect in this case. And so, again, as I said, Virginia mycin is, is used fairly often in the poultry industry, and it is known to be a growth promoter to reduce bile salt hydrolases, and there's a reduction in secondary bile acids when Virginia mycin is fed to animals. So, even though these antibiotics all have different bacteria that they affect in different um, effects on the gastrointestinal tract and the, the gastro, gastrointestinal microbiota, they all had a very similar effect on bile salt hydrolase activity. Um, this other, a more recent paper in 2014 found that these bile salt hydrolases are actually directly inhibited by antibiotics. So it's not just the antibiotics affecting the bacteria within the gastrointestinal tract, but these antibiotics are able to directly affect the enzyme bile salt hydrolase. So for example, tetracyclines had really high inhibition, 97, 90 to 97% inhibition of the bile salt hydrolase enzyme. Beta-lactam a little lower, um, lincosamide, the macrolides a little lower again, and bacitracin actually had no effect on, no direct effect on the bile salt hydrolases. So that's effects on the gastrointestinal microbiome. As I said, there's the, the effects on the host as well, immune modulation. Again, this was a very similar study to the one I showed you that we looked at the microbiota and the metabolites. So again, these are in, in broilers. We had the control diet, a diet with bacitracin and a diet with our bacillus 1781. And after three weeks, we looked to see if there was an effect on growth rate 
So there was a significant effect on growth rate, both with the bacitracin, which is an antibiotic growth promoter, and bacillus 1781. So both the antibiotic and the bacillus improved growth rate. However, then if you look at some of the immune factors, so for one, looking at alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, an acute phase protein in the serum, there was a significant reduction in this acute phase protein in the, in the birds that were fed the bacillus. So even though the growth rate effect was the same, there was a different effect on the Im immune system. And this is shown here, there were a, a large number of um, cytokines that were measured in the study. I'm just showing a subset of those here that were significantly higher within the bacillus treat treated and birds than the bacitracin versus the control. And again, this paper has been published by Dr. Wen Lillehoy. It's available in Research and Veterinary Science. A very similar study again that Wen Lillehoy did, again, three weeks, but now we were looking at expression of tight junction proteins. So we had the animals on a control diet, bacitracin, 1781 alone, 1104 and 747 combination, and 1781 and 747 combination. Again, this study was run for three weeks, and now we were looking at the expression within the in, um, intestinal cells, looking at the epithelial barrier gene expression in these broiler chickens. So here we have the luminal side of the gastrointestinal tract, the basolateral side, and these are the tight junction proteins that control whether these epithelial cells allow material to pass through or not. And so if we look at occludin, which is this one shown here in pur purple on the, on the luminal side, you'll see that two, the 1781 and the combination of 1104 and 747 actually increased expression of occludin. If you look at the ZO1, and these are shown here in blue, these actually regulate whether um, the, the tight junctions, whether they should open or close, and there's an ex increased expression in the 1104 plus 747 combination and 1781 plus 747 combination of the ZO1. And then if you look at um, JAM, which is now on the basolateral side, um, this particular protein here, the, the gene expression was again increased in these two with the, com with the two combinations. So there's an ex increased expression of tight junction proteins within the gastrointestinal tract of these birds. And we've also um, looked within tissue culture to see if we can uh, replicate that within the, the, the lab and we can. All right, so what I hope to have shown you is that we select our bacteria specifically to um, have a direct effect on the pathogens through the secondary metabolites they produce, and then how that will then help the levels of clostridia within the, the ruminant, as Jesse showed you. But they also have an effect on the gastrointestinal microbiome. They have an effect on microbial succession, metabolite production within the gastrointestinal tract, and then they have an effect on the host as well, um, whether that's directly or due to some of the other microbes that are present within the gastrointestinal tract. And then they have a direct, we've seen a direct effect on the barrier function as well um, with an improvement in tight junction proteins. So at this point, I'd like to hand it back over to Tom so he can ask any questions that might have come through. Thank you, Sandra. And for anybody interested, just please type in your question into the text box and we'll get that relayed on to both uh, Jesse and Sandra. So the first question I have is, I, I guess, more for Jesse. Uh, Jesse, um, the question is, uh, what's more important, the level or type of Clostridia in a dairy cow? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we, we talked about the two types, right? The, the toxigenic type and the solvatogenic type. And I think each of them come with their own sets of challenges. One more of a, a, of a death loss as an outcome and one more as a um, uh, hampering on efficiency and suboptimal performance. But I think the level would be the, the bigger concern because once those, once those clostridia reach a certain level, that's when they really start impacting uh, rumen and gastrointestinal function. And if, I mean, they're present in almost 
all fecal samples as you saw in the survey results and if you can keep them at a lower level you won't really see the negative impacts that, that you would if they're at that higher level so de definitely the level is going to be the, the bigger factor very good very good second question uh, probably also for jesse uh why is clostridio growing in a tmr sample Assuming Clostridia is anaerobic and TMR is incorporating air as it's being mixed and made, why is an anaerobic bacteria growing in a TMR sample? Yeah, that's a great question. And we were asking ourselves that same question when we first observed the outgrowth. And we've actually simulated this outgrowth within the lab. And, and so, so we played a TMR sample prior to uh, heat and environmental humidity exposures. And then after exposure for a period of time, we see the outgrowth. We've done community analysis and we believe that there's other bacteria within that sample utilizing oxygen and creating a, a less, uh, less oxygen, a lower oxygen environment allowing for that outgrowth of Clostridia within that TMR matrix is our current hypothesis. Okay. And this one is probably more for Zandra. Um, how often does the biodiversity of Clostridium perfringens change over time on a daily on a dairy or feedlot. So how often does the diversity change? We've only ever come back and sampled after two weeks, but we've already seen that change after two weeks. If the change is due though to feed, it can happen fairly quickly. So if the the feed stuff's like that day 58 on that sample I showed you where there was a challenge of clostridia within the feed, um, I think it can happen pretty quickly. Okay, another one here. How important is uh, animal transport or relocation between regions to changing the terroir or diversity? Yeah, I can take that one. We We've we've observed some of this in, in receiving cattle and, and feedlots, and what we do see uh, certain sources of of animals can come in potentially with a higher challenge. But I think a lot of this is dictated by environmental factors and, and feedstuffs. So um, sampling the same animals over a period of time, we've observed less than a week that the the impacts of the feed and environment can be adjusted um, it, after that relocation or after the movement of that animal. Okay, very good. Um, another question here. What's the relationship between isolates, clostridium perfringens isolates from beef and dairy sources? Have we done that work, guys? Comparing the beef clostridium perfringens to the dairy clostridium perfringens, is there an overlap? If we think about those clouds that we share with Rob's analysis. Sure, and I don't think we've analyzed the database as wholes, but it, looking at individual beef feedlots compared to individual dairy sites, we do see increased diversity at, at at beef feedlots compared to what we typically see at, at dairy. So I'd imagine we're going to have more outliers, more more unique isolates specific in our in our beef library compared to our dairy library. But the actual comparison has not <clears throat> been completed yet. Is that correct? Subsets, but not as a whole. No. Okay. Okay. Very good. Sandra, this one's probably more for you. How long will it take for fiber degraders to change enough to get a difference in total fiber digestibility? So in the in the study we did, the the one where we only saw a difference after 140 days. But I mean, if you're affecting these bacteria grow fairly quickly in, within the rumen. So if conditions are more optimal for them, they will be able to grow and they will change. We haven't. We are doing some studies where we're looking more often at the fiber di fiber digesting population, but I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly how long it will take to see an effect in the fiber degraders. Right. So I think we're at the point where we've been able to measure those population differences, but yet haven't put the full picture together. 
I, yeah. I know that uh, Oklahoma State University is uh, completing that trial soon, and we should have an answer to that question, provided we can see a fiber um, fibrolytic bacterial population differences. Zondra, any concern that antimicrobials produced by bacillus results in antimicrobial resistance um, in the food supply? And is this a risk for public health or safety? Okay, so if, if you look at what these bacteria are producing, they're producing really small amounts of um, many different types of antimicrobials. And they're producing them right where they need it within the gastrointestinal tract. It's not the same as taking an antibiotic where you're taking this huge bolus, feeding it into the animal, and you're immediately killing a whole lot of bacteria, and then the ones that are left are the ones that are resistant. Um, in fact, if you look at some of these antibiotics, such as bacitracin, which is very similar to what these anti what the bacteria, what the bacillus are producing, it's actually very hard for even if you are feeding those at high doses for, for bacteria to become resistant to them. So, plus there's they they act synergistically as well. So, you're producing nine to eleven antimicrobials in small amounts that work synergistically. So, an organism would have to develop multiple antibiotic resistances to be able to overcome it. Okay. And Zandra, you brought up the idea of the um, impact of bacillus on arthrobitis. Uh, arthrobitis candidatus, I believe, is the unknown you know, group of organisms that are clustery related. Why is it that those clustery related organisms are unimpacted by the bacillus? So, I mean, there's the strain to strain differences anyway on how bacteria get affected by um, the bacillus, but arthrobitis, they actually bind really, really closely to the gastrointestinal tract. They actually bind to the epithelial cells. You'll find them within the mucus layer. They, um, so they'll be less affected even by other antimicrobials that are, you know, if you put antibiotics in the diet and stuff as well, just because of where they are found within the gastrointestinal tract. Um, but they probably also have different types of cell walls, different types of, um, ribosomes, et cetera, than um, the other clustering perfringens that we're looking at. Now, again, arthromatous, Tom said it was called candidatus, and the reason for that is that it has been identified based on its DNA signature, but has not yet been cultured or grown. So we can't really test to see how sensitive arthromatous is to any of our bacillus. Right. And I think the key thing is that this is the same group of organisms that were identified very early when you look at some of the studies by feeding Virginia mycin and other antimicrobials, so or other antibiotics, so it's it's been a group that's actually been looked at in terms of its ability to produce a large variety of different enzymes that improve efficiency in particularly monogastric systems. So I think uh, it's exciting that we see the potential for that same mechanism of response, uh, and can explain some of the feed efficiency improvements we see in in broiler and other poultry systems. And here's one for both of you, um, a good commercial one. How do I compare two DFMs or targeted microbial solutions that contain Bacillus subtilis on my farm? Jesse, I'll let you take that first. Sure, yeah. Uh, and, and I think it's don't you? Yeah, I think we've we've seen a fair amount of this. Uh, we, we've definitely done comparisons of different bacillus subtilis strains in in vitro in the lab and then we've seen that translate to in vivo on dairies as far as controlling clostridia and other pathogen loads but but i mean i think the the most important part is to remember that not all bacillus subtilis are created equal there there's different strains with di different functionalities and i mean we see it in the microbial terroir process all the time identifying new strains based on shifts in diversity and species present um, and certain strains of bacillus in our portfolio perform better in specific situations looking at specific groups of clostridium perfringens or inhibiting different species of clostridia so i think it's important to um, weigh out that as diversity and and 
um, species change on a dairy, I think you got to stay on top of different formulations to optimize your inhibition of, uh, of those pathogens. And just remember that not all bacillus subtilis are, are created equal. It's not one size fits all. Yeah, the only thing I can add to that is that if Jesse's group does come across a pathogen that's not inhibited well by the cluster by the bacilli that we have in our library right now, then we'll start looking for other bacillus that will be effective. Very good. And a question here about vaccinations. I have routinely vaccinated with clostridial vaccines to cover against these challenges. What about auto, um, autogenous vaccines? Are they better? Um, I don't really know. Jesse, any comments on that? Then routine clostridial vaccinations and dairy systems, Jesse? Yeah, I would say just based on our, our survey work, based on the diversity that we've identified within, you know, if we're talking about Clostridium perfringens as a whole, I mean, if we're looking, if we're talking about a specific dairy and we're doing the genetic fingerprinting based on Clostridium perfringens that we've cultured, we're identifying between anywhere between 35 and 40 clusters of that Clostridium perfringens pretty routinely. And I think to, to say that you would have uh, coverage over all of that diversity by utilizing a vaccine, I, I think it'd be pretty tough. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. I mean, it is about the diversity, and you also see that the diversity changes region to region. As Jesse pointed out, there's some work that uh, Zondra's team has done to show there are significant differences within community uh, across that, as well as clostridium perfringens communities within some of these regions. So. An autogenous, you can imagine, is better, but at the same time, how can you capture and stay actively um, vigilant against the changing uh, diversity across a cluster, a cluster, typical dairy or feedlot? So I think that's uh, that's always a difficult one for vaccines to address. Not seeing any other questions, I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, this will be available uh, because it has been recorded, so that will come back to you in an email for access. Uh, I know it goes through the YouTube channel. So appreciate everybody's um, time today and uh, wish everybody a, a good rest of day.